Thank you, praise team. Spectacular. I'm going to ask you a hard question today. If you were to take your whole life, it's on the next screen, uh, if you can move it down. If you could take your whole life and compare it to the best you could have been, what God meant you to be, scale of one to ten, what number would you give yourself? What you have done so far compared to what you could have been, three, six, nine, ten? If 10 was your potential, what your dreams were, God's dreams for you, what you'd like to have done, what have you actually done? Think hard about it. Just to give you my own sort of stories, you've heard bits and pieces of this. I was in Chicago, probably 40 years old, when I heard a message called Impact Players, and I've made my own sermon all over the world about that. Bill Heibel said every coach is out looking for impact players. Easy to find the other players, hard to find impact players. I went to the Orangewood girls playoff game and I stayed for the game after that. They said, Pastor Dan, the San Gabriel Academy team is pretty good. They had this kid that they recruited, Marcus Levet Jr. Fantastic. Out of the 50, 55 points, he made 40 of the points. Just He could go anywhere on the court, score anytime he wanted to. Fantastic player, one of the top players in the country. He was going to come to Orangewood until the week before school started. Impact player. Everybody wants him. They're all fighting over the impact players, the Kobe Bryants and the LeBron James and the Carmelo Anthony. They're all trying to get the best. Then you can fill out your team with all the others, but they're looking for impact players. And this preacher said, God is looking for impact players. Impact players are those players who are not afraid to have the ball at the end of the game, to carry the team when the time comes. They refuse to lose. He said, God is looking for impact players. Plenty of players who will sit in the pew and just kind of go through the motions. And I was 40 years old, and I said, what am I going to do? with the rest of my life to be an impact player. Three or four years later, same preacher was preaching, Bill Hybels, and he told the story of going to see Billy Graham. Billy Graham was old already, 80s and 90s, up in his house up in North Carolina. Bill Hybels went there from Chicago, walked in, and they've talked for a while, and then Billy Graham said, Billy? <laughs> and Bill Hybels said, the only one I let him call me Billy. Billy, how old are you? Well, he said, probably uh, not a good idea to lie to Billy Graham. He said, well, I'm 45. And he said, uh, I am coming to the end of my time. But you still have half of your life yet to live. What are you going to do with it, Bill? He said, use it to build up a church. Do something, to do something great for God to build up a church. And Bill Heibel said, he went back down to the motel that night, knelt by his bed, and just said, God, I've got half my life left to live. Help me use it to build up the church for God. And I had to think through what I had left in my life. I'd used up half of my career. I had half of my life yet to go. What was I going to do with it? You only have one life to live. You don't want to waste it. You want to make it count for as much as you could count. And I began to do some other things that I had not been willing to do. And what I've done in the last uh, 20 years has been partly because of the commitments I made that, that week. The other talk that probably had most impact on my life at one point was a, just a Chamber of Commerce talk a lady gave one time in Chicago about thick or thin. I never heard of that distinction before, but she said, thin. Thin is what you talk about when you say, please pass the butter. Isn't it awfully hot? Who are the Lakers going to get to play with Kobe? It's just video games and sports and weather and movies and food and just the basic machinery of life. Are you going to pick up the kids? It's just nothing wrong with it. It's just thin. Or you can choose to live your life thick and take more chances and try to do some things that you hadn't tried before and see something that's wrong and do something to fix it. Thick or thin. Thick is water skiing. Thin is riding in the boat. 
<laughs> Thick is trying surfing. Thin is standing on the pier and watching them. You get the idea. Most of us went uh, zip lining last Monday. Other people said, we'll be the ones to drive the backpacks and pick them up for you over here. Thin or thick. Let me ask you some other hard questions. A couple of our people went right from our trip to go on a cruise for a week. And I asked her, which do you think is going to be more fun, the mission trip or the cruise? Some of our people flew from Manila, went down to Australia, and they're going on that bridge walk over Sydney to have a night at the Sydney Opera House, and they're going to see kangaroos. Which would they rather do if they had to choose? Which was more fun? We have two weeks in Hawaii still this fall. Which is going to be more fun, a two-week mission trip or Hawaii? Or I've asked it this way over the years. If you took everybody and divided them into two groups, one group is fully devoted to Christ, the other group is only halfway, partly devoted to Christ, at the end of their life, as you take everything they've ever done, which group will have more fun, the fully devoted group or the halfway devoted group? And people say, the half. And I say, no, John 10, I came to give you life and life more abundantly. So I'm going to try to convince you to live more thick today. Everyone who goes to the mission trip with me knows we talk about thin and thick. When it begins to rain, we all say, is it feeling thick enough for you today? <laughs> But let me tell you more about this story. As soon as we got off the plane, Josh had been there five, six days. Josh began to harass me about the church that was destroyed by the tornado. I said, Josh, there are no tornadoes in the Philippines. Yes, there are. Not an earthquake, not a typhoon. It was a tornado. So on that Friday, when we did a little tour, they took me to that place. You saw the picture in the earlier pictures. So just let it sit for a moment here. Just weeds and rock. The other little huts had been rebuilt in the last two months. All there was was a little cement where the platform had been. And he said, we need a church here. I had only been planned to help the churches where we were preaching. We weren't preaching here. He said, Pastor Dan, we have to do something. How much? 3,600 U.S. Well, we scraped the money together somehow. That next Sunday morning, they began to do the footings, digging the trenches and putting down the block and the cement. We had rain, we had trouble, had to wait for it to cure. Finally on Thursday, they were ready. The cement block were up two or three courses, and our cement crew, my sons, all their group, everybody, they all went, and Josh, and they poured the cement. I didn't hear any more about it for a while. They were working on it. We went away. Now we're done with the crusade. It's Sunday. It's Monday. We went to the beach. We went to the lake. We did the zip lining. On Tuesday, we had an afternoon at the beach, hour and a half away. And they said, Pastor Dan, they want you to come see that church where we poured the slab that was destroyed by the tornado. We really didn't have time. I don't know how we could fit this in, but they said, Pastor Dan, we've got to come. They wanted us to come as late in the day as possible because they were still working on it. The president had not come with us because he wanted to be out there working on that site. He said, Pastor Dan, we have a surprise for you. Well, I thought maybe when we get there, there might be the walls up. That might be the surprise. So all the cement crew, we all dressed up in our best clothes. We drove out there 40 minutes out there, maybe 20 of us. We parked here. We walked down the long little dirt, dark road, no lights. All of a sudden, there's 100 people standing around, and kids and people and cars and trucks. And we came around a corner. And here was this church. That was up. In nine days, from weeds and rock to a full church with the front of it, with the roof up, with tile on the floor, with this wood cement, with the wood drop ceiling already in, the electricity, the fans were blowing, pews were in there, and they were trying to hang the glass sign up on top. From Thursday when they poured the slab, Friday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, they had finished the rest of the church. Amen? 
as good as it gets. As good as it gets. Can you read what it says on that banner? We are now the old Garden Grove Church because they are now the new Garden Grove SDA Church. Amen? <laughs> it doesn't get any better than that. And they sang songs, and they wanted people to speak. They didn't tell us ahead of time. They, Josh, would you come up and talk? Jock couldn't finish his talk, thanking everybody. I had to get up and say something. No plan. I just think of it while you're walking. Then we had a prayer dedication, and we walked into this church as a little parade. Doesn't get any better than that. I got these pictures at 1 o'clock this morning. They're 15 hours ahead of us. They had church there this week. It's pretty cool. Is that thick? That's thick. It wasn't quite done. We scraped together another $1,500 to try to get the paint and the plaster done this week. They want a fence. I don't have any money. If somebody wants to build a fence, you can finish the Garden Grove Church over there. Nine days. We got up a couple mornings at 4 o'clock in the morning to watch World Cup games. My sons are half Dutch. They watched the semifinal game. One goal away from being in the finals. But even if we had won the World Cup, that would not equal seeing that church built in nine days. Thick. The passage for today comes from the story of Philip. We're going through the book of Acts. If you can follow here in chapter 8, verse 26. As for Philip, an angel of the Lord said to him, he's just a deacon, just a deacon, if we can say it that way. They asked him to come and help serve food and take care of the widows and the people in the church. But now he is preaching. And now an angel of the Lord takes him, go down south to the desert road that runs from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out and he met the treasurer of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under the queen. Had gone to Jerusalem to worship and he was now returning. Seated in his carriage, he was reading aloud from the book of the prophet Isaiah. The Holy Spirit said to Philip, go over and walk along beside the carriage. Philip ran over, heard the man reading from the prophet Isaiah. Philip asked, do you understand what you are reading? How can I understand unless someone instructs me? Philip gets in there, he explains to him from Isaiah. They stop and they see a pool of water and he baptizes him. Famous story. Then the Holy Spirit takes Philip away. All the commentaries do not know whether it just means that the angel and the Holy Spirit were walking him on the road or were they just flying him in instant travel from place to place. I don't know which it is either, but I like to believe that God just flew him out there. That Philip got up in the morning and the next minute he is standing running along the road along this chariot and then God flies him to the next place. Can you imagine how Philip felt at the end of that day? When God flew him out to a desert and somehow this man with a thousand pages of the Old Testament is reading Isaiah 53, exactly the chapter about Jesus. And when he gets convicted of the Holy Spirit to accept Christ, somehow in the middle of a desert, there's a pool of water right there at that moment and he baptizes him and then God flies him to the next place. And Philip says, God, can we just do this every day? But you would just move me where you want me to baptize more people. Thick, thick. We have an academy in a little small college 45 minutes out from this city. I've been there before, preached there before. It's a precious place. Primitive, difficult. Five, six hundred students. They took me to the new girls' dorm that they have built, 12 girls into a little small room. All their stuff is on the bed with them. Primitive. But all the girls smiling and laughing. Fantastic place. 370 girls in this little college. Bathrooms are slums. They cook all their own food. We're doing the best we can to do a few things for them. I finished preaching to these five or 600 kids. A whole group stands around me and said, Pastor Dan, we'd like to sing you a song. And they said, you baptized us 
five years ago. I flew over for a weekend, flew in, spoke, baptized, flew home. When I got off the plane that time, they met me at the airport and they said, Pastor Dan, we're going to baptize five or six hundred people. We have no churches for any of them. It's a new unentered area. It's not safe for you to go. I said, what do you need? We need nine churches. How much each church? $1,800. I said, give me a telephone. I sat there by the telephone and called everybody I knew. Can you do one church, half a church, anything? Raised enough money for those nine churches, simple churches. They took a pastor who was not a pastor yet, great young man, Pastor Romano. He was here. Love this man. He's in some of those pictures. They made him the district pastor for those churches. Those nine churches are now 17. He begged me for seven more. We're trying to do at least one. In five years, he has taken that district from zero members to 1,700 members, and they baptized 200 more last Sabbath. And they said... We want to sing a song for you because we want to thank you for baptizing us five years ago. And Art and Josh got to stand there with me as this group that I baptized, that now they are teachers and professionals and working. There's some of these pictures you've been seeing. And they sang a song to me. Thick, thick. I don't have any pictures of this. There were two Bible workers that asked me to go at 7 o'clock in the morning to do worship at a store. I don't know what I was walking into. I walked into this room. I'll, I'll go anywhere. They did not tell me they wanted me to speak. While I'm there, they said, could you give a little devotional? I had to sit there and think of something quick. Every single girl who worked there was in this worship. Where do you have that in America where Vons or Best Buy has worship in the morning? Here they were, 33, beautiful, young, 20-something Filipino, mostly single girls. And our Bible workers put up a little thing, and they gave a little Bible study on baptism. And then they wanted me to speak. I don't know what to say, but I'll just tell you, as I began to go, something kicked in. I began lit up. I gave them my heart and soul. Not much English. The next Sabbath morning at 6.30 in the morning, 12 of those girls were baptized. I couldn't be there for all of that. Pastor Sarah May and I and asked them to out to dinner. We met them at a Jollibee restaurant. 25 of them came to that restaurant, 12 who had been baptized that morning. We did the best we could with language barriers and talking. The supervisors and Adventists, I said, you've got to work out Sabbath work schedule now for all these Monday night they called me and said, Pastor Dan, can you go again in the morning? 5.30 in the morning, they drove me and another guy, and we baptized three more of those beautiful, precious girls. And a man who had lost his leg, has cancer, had tumors growing out of his head. The pastor picked him up, and I baptized one of the girls while he put that crippled man under the water, just five of us out there in the ocean. It's thick. It's thick. To see young people just get it, catch it. That's why we do this. I don't just do it to fly around the world to try to be a big star. I want the next generation to catch it. Mission and service, God. That's why I recruit young pastors to go. Young pastors from all over our conference went, our own young pastors. To see them catch it, to see Art Morales catch it, Art preaches in Sabbath all the time, but to hear, see him get the idea of preaching evangelism, Art just got it. Pretty soon, Art is the one trying to raise my Pastor Dan, we have got to do this church. Art got it. See my sons catch. Art became the leader of the cement crew when Josh couldn't be there. But I'm going to tell you about one girl that got it. She's a Filipino young girl. She came over from the Philippines many years ago when she was 13. Parents are nurses in Loma Linda. She tried to take nursing, didn't work it out La Sierra. She's now a music student at La Sierra. We heard about her. Carol wanted to have her come and sing. Lisa Bethan called her up. 
Lisa had never heard her sing. I, none of us had heard her sing. We don't let anyone sing. We haven't tried out. They made her sing on the phone. Remember this? They made Paulette sing on the phone to her. She did it. And we had her sing upstairs for evangelism. Nailed three songs. Unbelievable talent. She won number one of all the music students at La Sierra. When my other soloist dropped out, I called her up and I said, if I find some money for you to go, can you go? She had one, one penny to her name. We had to find every penny to get her over there. So here's this girl who's never sung for evangelism before, singing at our site. Pretty soon she had the words and she's figuring this out, how to do a pure soprano voice. Every night, better and better. We came to last Sabbath, a week ago right now. I was pushed beyond anything. Had to write a sermon late that night, finish it up in the morning, every moment in the car. Everyone is sitting here. There's 5,000 people here, and now I'm sitting here trying to get the last few pictures in the right order. People harass Pastor Dan. We got to go. Sorry. They're singing. Choirs are singing. I finally got my part done. And Paulette stood up to sing. Sent me this picture I was, while I was driving here this morning. We just put it in. 26 years old. First time in her life. And she stands in front of 5,000 people in the stadium. Did she sing Holy City? What did she sing? I'm not sure what song she sang. Some second coming song. And just pure... And she just grabs that microphone and begins to sing this song, verse after verse, higher and higher and more power, and finally comes to the end of the song and just peels off a high C and just rivets 5,000 people to this song. I just... She gets it. This young lady who was used to singing to a few students at music recitals of La Sierra, now would take her around the world and she stands up and sings in front of 5,000 people and just kills it for Jesus in front of that crowd. Amen? It's thick. A blessing to me. If I can just say as quickly as I can, I know I need to build quicker here. Number one, your best, thickest moments will always be doing something crazy for God. For the purest, most direct sugar of thickness, it is always doing something for God. You can do other things that would make it thick. The president of the Hawaii Conference, Ralph Watson, and I have been friends since we grew up together overseas. He and I planned our own mission trip. We went to Thailand to speak weeks of prayers. And I just signed off one time and said, Ralph, let's go over there and storm the world for God. We talk about that ever since. We put that on the back of all the t-shirts, storm the world. I've done a lot of cool things in my life. I've had a chance to see the Taj Mahal and go to Victoria Falls and to go to game parks and see the animals. I have lived in this city where 14 NBA championships have happened. Does anybody beat that? I am blessed with people like Carol and Kimber and Beverly and others who bring me the coolest desserts. I have eaten some of the best food in the world. I have gone drift scuba diving in Cozumel. You just stand, you just cover and watch the coral fish go by. I've lived a very lucky life. But my favorite moments, my thickest moments, are always God moments. Baptizing people, buying motorcycles for pastors in the Philippines, building houses for families in Tijuana, orphanages for AIDS kids in Thailand, going back to schools that we have built, and here's the kids going to that school, and they stand up and sing a song for you. Thick. Thick. You go to the next picture, Connor. This girl. Can't tell you much about it. Drama. But Art and I, some others, talked to her late Tuesday night. Fantastic young lady. Was part of our cooking team there around the whole time. Catholic, not made a decision. We begged her to make a decision. I got an email yesterday, Facebook, last night, and she said, I want you to know Pastor Dan. Pastor Kaderman, the mission president, baptized me today at the beach. And I am now an SDA, now and forever. 
It felt awfully good to baptize 1,100 people last Sabbath morning, but it felt just as good to get that email this morning. Amen, all of you on our team? You all know this girl. She was there, part of our cafeteria every day. Doesn't get any better than that. Number two, it is always someone else. This Ethiopian is probably a converted Jew. Most commentators think. That's why he was in Jerusalem. Even though he was a black man from Ethiopia, he was probably a Jew. And he's reading Isaiah, and he gets in the chariot with Philip, and he says, is this one in Isaiah, this, this Messiah passage, is this t- the prophet talking about himself, or is this talking about someone else? And Philip tells him the good news about Jesus. No, it's about Jesus. It's about someone else. And if I can just say this clearly, the answer is always, is always about someone else. Amen? It is always someone else. It's not you or me. It doesn't matter how much of the holy list you can keep. It doesn't matter even if you are more holy than 99% of all the people around you. Even if you have read the whole Bible, then Ellen White can draw all the charts. Even if you are a vegan and a virgin and would never think about an R-rated movie, it will never be about you. It will always be about someone else. Once in a while, someone gets a crazy idea or they'll say something about us. The barbershop guy yesterday asked me if I said, Dad, Pastor Dan, I hear that you're a mason. Okay, that's bothered any of you. I don't know any masons. I've never met a mason. I'm not a mason. (laughs) Unless you can be a mason without knowing about it. (laughs) And then I heard someone else say the other day, they heard about Garden Grove and Pastor Dan, that we were liberal. Well, I don't know if we're liberal or not. I don't think so. Yes, we believe in keeping all of the Ten Commandments and in the 28 fundamental beliefs. Yes, we believe in living God-honoring lives. And yes, we believe you can add 12 years to your life by eating better. Yes, yes, yes. And yes, we want to go on mission trips and baptize a lot of people and build churches and help a 1,000 people a day at the medical clinics. But none of that gives you one extra credit against with God. It is always about someone else. Jesus shouted out, it is finished. And it is finished from that day until the last day. Amen. It is always about someone else. And that's what Philip said. Number three, Jesus is always better. This man was numbered there too under the queen of Ethiopia. He is high and he is rich and he is powerful. And then he hears about Jesus. And immediately that moment he knows he wants that. That what he has is not enough. Postmodernism says it doesn't really matter what you believe. It doesn't matter what you already know. You have every right to believe whatever you already believe. No one has a right to tell you that what you have is not as good as theirs or that theirs is better than yours. No one has a right to say anything is better than anyone else. And yet this moment, he immediately knows that what he is hearing is better than what he already has. And we would stand tall and say, Jesus is always better than whatever you have before. He's always better. We are going to have a weekend. Let me tell you about it now clearly. In three weekends, the first weekend of August called He's the One. There was the one project that's taken over the church all over the world and now in Australia and all Thailand. They're doing He's the One weekends. Not because they want to minimize anything of Adventism. They just want to say the center of the Adventist message is Jesus and Jesus alone. That whatever we do in Adventism is only connected because of Jesus, tied to Jesus, inherent in Jesus Christ. And I said, why can't we do it here? Only a few of us got to go up there to Seattle. And so we're going to do, he's the one right here. Friday night, Sabbath morning, Sabbath afternoon, couple, no more time than you already spend here at church. But I invite you to come to that. 20-minute messages, the best we can say about Jesus and the gospel. And then we will open up to round table discussions. White tablecloth, potluck next Sabbath, August 2. He's the one. If you've ever said, I wish they would just stick to Jesus, this weekend is for you. If you've ever said, I'm pretty sure I will always be a Christian, but I'm not sure I'll always be an Adventist, this weekend is for you. If you've always wanted to invite somebody but scared we might start talking about charts and beasts or something crazy, This weekend is for you. The great music, great graphics, great messages, the best, clearest, purest, on fire, Jesus. Number four, there was always one more level to go. This man was a Jew. They thought they were the ultimate God's chosen people, and yet he's out here studying. He's still studying. He has a soft heart trying to learn to get closer to God, open to going to the next level with God. 
And I just want to say God is always sending a Philip into your life to come alongside you, to lead you to the next level. Wherever you are today, there is one more level for you. There's always a level deeper to get closer to God. If you will keep reading and stretching and be open, God will take you to another level with him. And then you go to be Philip yourself and you get involved in the game and you become a Philip, a deacon. He thought that's what he was now, just serving food and helping take care of All of a sudden now he goes to the next level and he's preaching and he's leading this man to Christ who becomes an evangelist to all the country of Ethiopia. And all of a sudden God is flying you around to bring people to him. And all of a sudden, some of our people went overseas and they're speaking. Southern University had 120 young people go and preach this summer for him in Philippines and Argentina. Not all theology majors. People who just said, okay, I'm willing to go to the next level and do something for God. There's always another level. Now the last story. 2,400 people last Sabbath decided that there was another level beyond where they were. The church they were a part of wasn't enough, and they needed to go to one more level in their picture of God. They told me on our way to that baptism Sabbath afternoon, there's a pastor, a Sunday pastor is going to be baptized. I've met some of them before. They have baptized a hundred in this mission so far. And we got to the pool. We were way late. They kept us. Anyway, long story. We got into the water, I began to baptize, almost done, and they brought this pastor to me. I can keep going, I think the picture is here. I think that's him, not very clear, sorry. Sunday pastor, little church up in the mountain village, studied with somebody, decided to transfer his allegiance to the Adventist church. Have to go from a salary job to being a farmer again. I baptized him, looked into his eyes, and baptized a fellow pastor. Unbelievable. Start taking pictures afterwards. I said, bring your church. They brought most of their church, and most of the church members got baptized also. Picture the whole group. I let it go. Sunday we did stuff. Monday we went to things. Monday afternoon we're at a lake riding on a boat, and they said, Pastor Dan, they want you to come. They're going to go up to the mountain church. They're going to change the sign on the church. <laughs> I'd heard of this, never seen it myself. And so I called out to the group, anybody want to go up and see? Well, a bunch of people got in two vans. We drove up 40 minutes in the little crummy, terrible road. All of a sudden, we came to this little open area, and here was this church. Whole village was there. We're the only game in town, the only church in town. And they were changing the whole church from an Alliance Sunday church to a Seventh-day Adventist church. They decided that there was one more level of truth that they could go to. So here was this pastor and all these people. And they brought a table out and they put the table there and they put a bench on top of the table. And Art Morales and Hector Ramal, another Spanish pastor, climbed up on there. And our two guys ripped the old sign off. Everybody cheered, and then they put up a banner that said the name of that church and the Seventh-day Adventist church. We went inside. We sang. We dedicated it. It wasn't quite finished. I raised some more money over the week. They're up there organizing it this Sabbath. New leaders, new everything. And we hope to have that church painted and tiled and plastered by the end of next week. One more level. If I can just say one more thing before I'm done. Some of you may be saying, Pastor Dan, it feels like what you're saying is that if you want to live a thick life, you have to go on mission trips, you have to go overseas. No, I'm not. You can be thick right here, right now, every day. The Holy Spirit does not have to fly you around to the desert. The Holy Spirit can give you holy moments where you are right here today. Potluck hallways, your work, your life, your family. And it sounds like maybe you're saying, Pastor Dan, is that you have to sort of leave all the other fun behind. 
and all the parties and sports and videos and all the rest of life and just go do mission and church and all the religious stuff. No, I'm not saying that either. You do not have to choose between the best of God and the best of the world. If you'll take the best of God, he will give you the best of both. You do not have to choose. We baptize people and we went zip lining. And we built churches and we went to the beach and played volleyball on the sand. And we went up to this lake and we rode boats and we did all of that. And we baptized people and we did medical dental clinics. And on the way back, we drank, ate hollow hollows in the Chow King restaurant. You do not have to choose. And we came back on Monday night after that whole day of that sign changing and all of that. And we went in and they had a program for us and they gave us gifts and there were speeches and music and cheering and laughing and the video. Then they brought us outside, said one more thing, and they had 15 minutes of fireworks outside for us, equal to Disneyland. I don't know who paid for it, maybe my money paid for it, I don't even know. All I know is they did it. And we just stood there. <laughs> This is pretty good to be the other side of the world and baptizing people and changing signs on churches and we get to see fireworks. You do not have to choose between having a thick life for God. I will just tell you that the best thick moments come from God and when you're serving God. Amen? God bless you. Thank you.